Hi, everybody. How are we doing? Yeah? How was lunch? Okay. No napping. So um, the book that, that, that you see on the screen is a book from about a year ago um, that, in, to a certain degree, inspires and is the foundation for some of the new work that I'm going to talk to you all about today and share with you for a book that I'm in the middle of writing. So maybe they'll invite me back when that comes out. Who knows? Um, and we'll get going. So there are currently more people migrating across the world than at any other time in human history. 244 million people have left their homelands for a better life elsewhere. Many choose to move for work and higher pay, but increasingly there is no choice involved. Over 60 million migrants are believed to be forced and displaced by violence of all kinds, political, ethnic, sexual, and environmental. And within those displaced, 26 million are categorized as refugees and asylum seekers. And that's a number that roughly matches the population of North Korea, a number that is actually bigger than the population of Hungary or New Zealand or Jamaica, a number that is bigger than the populations of over 200 other countries around the world. The Migrant Songbook is the name that I give for how all these movements, chosen and forced, willed and coerced, successful and failed, embraced and halted, are changing the way the world sounds. Since the start of this century, the 21st century, 22 new walls have been erected between countries around the world to stop the flow of undocumented and unwanted people. And for each wall, for each checkpoint, for each camp and detention center, there has been music that tries to make sense of it and struggle against it and inevitably finds a way of crossing through it. It seems proper, George Steiner wrote last century, that those who create art in a civilization of quasi-barbarism, which has made so many homeless, should themselves be poets unhoused and wanderers across language. It also seems to me proper that in this next century, so many of those who make the music of global society are singers and guitarists and DJs and oud players and dumbek drummers and rappers who are also unhoused, musical wanderers, seeking freedom and forging new political subjectivities across language, across borders, across nations, and through, under, and over walls. Al-Mambo Sudani, Mambo, Al-Mambo Al-Fikayani, Mambo, Al-Udi Fikamani, Mambo, Adi Ajmal Al-Hani, Mambo, Mambo, Ya Habiba Mahlaki, Mambo, Dal Mambo Khalaki, Mambo, Titmayel Fukhutaki, Ala Angham Al-Mambo, Mambo, al mambo sudani, mambo, al mambo fikayani, mambo fi, udi fikamani, mambo wadi, ajmal al hani, mambo. A couple of months ago, I sat at a plastic bistro table in Victoria Embankment Gardens in London's West End across from Mohammed Sarar. And before he started singing, he told me about growing up in the countryside outside of Khartoum, about growing up surrounded by the music of his uncles, of loving the songs of Kamal Tarbas and Mohammed Wadi, and about being stabbed by a member of the Sudanese government's military police, and then arrested for his peaceful demonstrations against what he calls his country's shit government. When he was released, he knew he had to leave. His family paid a smuggler, and Sarar was piled into a truck that traveled across the Sahara Desert toward Libya for six days. The sea was difficult, he told me, but not as difficult as the desert. No food, no water, little air. 
In Libya, he was put on a small boat that took him, that took him to Sicily, where he spent a few days in a detention center before he was released and set out for France. He hid in the bathroom of trains, caught and kicked off, caught and kicked off, and soon made it to Calais. He declared asylum to French police, who just told him to head to that Calais refugee camp, the one next to the underwater Euro tunnel and the ferry port on the English Channel. Known as the jungle, the camp was already notorious, an unofficial and un unrecognized tent city of nearly 10,000 people from across Africa and the Middle East. At Calais, Sara lived in the Sudanese tent, its own neighborhood, for a few weeks and started a Sudanese band. It was only when I played music, he told me, that I could live my moment. One morning at 2 a.m., he snuck into the back of a delivery truck and seven hours later made it to Birmingham. He was put with fellow Sudanese refugees in a shelter hotel in Croydon, then in an accommodation center in Wakefield, then a shared house in Bradford, and then once his status was confirmed, he traveled to Manchester and eventually to London to reunite with two British theater producers that he had met in the Calais refugee camp. They were writing a play about the Calais camp and asked Mohammed to join the cast. He and the play have been on stage since 2016, first at the Young Vic in London, then at the Playhouse Theater in London, around the corner from the gardens where we met. And this past December, Mohammed and the play moved to New York, which they just finished their first off-Broadway run. The song he sang that day that we met was Mambo el Sudani, a song he grew up hearing. It was written and produced and popularized by his uncle, the great Sudanese singing star Sayed Khalifa, whose career ended with the rise of the Sudanese dictator Omar al-Bashir. In 1956, his uncle Khalifa released the song that made him into a musical hero, Ya Watani, or My Homeland, which was an ode to a Sudan that could not be returned to, a Sudan that had been taken away, a Sudan that his nephew, Mohammed, had inherited and had to leave. That day in the park, Mohammed wasn't just singing his uncle's songs. He was making a journey through sound, voice, and melody, a journey that he could make in no other form. It was a technique of refugee sonics, a method of migrant singing that I had seen all too many times before. Can music be a refuge? I asked him. Yes, he said, music can be a refuge. But then the song ends. And then what? This is in February, last February, a few S-Bahn stops outside of Berlin in Potsdam on the fifth floor of the former parliament of the state of Brandenburg, which is now a shared accommodation for refugees, or in the glossary, official glossary definition provided by the German Federal Office for Migration and Refugees, a quote, decentralized accommodation for asylum seekers who are no longer required to live in their reception facility. The voice you heard belongs to Marie Koge, who is a local white German violinist and educator. And the violin you heard was from Lakisar, a six-year-old girl from Syria whose family is living, still living, in that accommodation facility, and who is one of the many young students in the class of Mitmach Musik, a nonprofit organization that roughly translates as interactive music. And they offer weekly music lessons to the hundreds of Syrian, Iraqi, and Afghani refugees living in Berlin and living in this particular facility as they file asylum applications, await their status, and eventually move into independent housing. The instructors of these classes are mostly local Germans like Marie, but also immigrant Syrians and Iranians who came to Berlin during previous eras of migration. The kids 
speak to each other in Arabic and German, respond to the teachers in German. And on the many days that I visited, they all played both Middle Eastern melodies and European classical pieces on violins and cellos and acoustic guitars. As I watched and listened to members of populations forced out of their homes, uprooted by war and dictatorships and military occupations, play music together in the country where they are seeking asylum, in a space that they're, where they're literally being accommodated. I thought a lot about the role that music plays in negotiating displacement and forced movement in the age of free markets and unfree populations. An era, as we all know, of growing economic insecurity and inequality with mass movements of people seeking decent standards of living and escape from repressive regimes, poverty, zones of conflict, only to be met by increasing militarization of the very same borders and spaces of passage where money and trade and commerce travel freely. But I also thought about the more general role of music in responding to a condition of homelessness that the German philosopher and writer Martin Heidegger famously, as he put it, in 1946, the very same year that his Nazi colleagues found themselves on trial in Nuremberg, he said, homelessness is coming to be the destiny of the world. As the number of refugees and forced migrants continues to grow throughout the world, music projects like Mit Mach Musik have become common sites around the world. Music classes, workshops held in refugee camps, detention centers, schools, orchestras, community centers abound. From projects in Palestinian camps to the music initiatives of organizations like In Place of War, even the popular headphone company Skull Candy has donated headphones to refugees in camps around the world. Uh, endless list of projects. And they tend to engage and network with refugee musicians um, and do so alongside musical projects that have popped up all over the world bands, ensembles like the Babylon Orchestra or the Anti-National Embassy or the C Syrian Expat Orchestra, um, endless bands. In Germany, where I was doing a lot of this research last year, uh, these bands abound all over the place. Um, but then there's another aspect of music um, and the world of forced migrants and refugees that I would call visa beats or passport pop. Artists who uh, are making popular and globally circulated popular tracks about the tyranny of visas and passports and laissez-passes and airport security, to quote a few, want a visa, lost my visa, catch me at the border, I got visas in my name with a green passport, you can't passports easily, oh no, we're in trouble, TSA, want to burst my bubble, always get a random check when I rock the, stu walk, rock the stubble. I did so well up until that point. This is a genre that includes popular artists like M.I.A., the Sweatshop Boys, Kanan, J. Huzz, Burna Boy, Mashru Laila, Mode 9, Tuta Ad, Residente, Davido, Nicky Jam, J. Balvin, Ana Tiju, and even Elton John, who recently lent his classic 1970s hit Rocket Man to the Iranian filmmaker and refugee Majid Adin. And in a moving video submitted for a YouTube production contest, Adin recast Elton John's wayward astronaut as an Iranian refugee who travels to a new planet called London and who won't see his family for a long, long time. She packed my bags last night, free flight. Zero hour, 9 a.m. And I'm gonna be high as a kite by then. I miss the earth so much, I miss my wife. It's lonely out in space on such a time.
it's amazing, right, how changing the visual narrative and the visual context can change the impact of a song and produce a different set of emotional reactions and tears from the 70s to now. That impulse to use music as a mode of engaging with refugees and raising awareness about refugees, supporting and politicizing refugees, and empowering refugees actually dates back quite a long way, but especially back to the modern 20th century recognition of the refugee as a political, legal, and humanitarian subject by the UN and the end of World War II, with their, at the end of World War II, with their establishment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, the establishment of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in 1949, and the creation of the Refugee Convention of 1951. Now, these were political events, of course, juridical events, legislative events, but they were also musical events. Oh, did we lose the song? Or we might have lost the song. Um, you'll hear some more, don't worry. Um, and that music included, in 1949, uh, to celebrate the signing of the Declaration of Human Rights, a UN concert held at Carnegie Hall that featured Leonard Bernstein conducting the Boston Symphony Orchestra and Aaron Copland's preamble to a solemn occasion, with the actor Laurence Olivier performing the Declaration of Human Rights live. Now, lo not long after the creation of the UNHCR, the UN did something that I never would have guessed. They created their own record label. And beginning in the early 1960s, began issuing 7-inch singles and 12-inch LPs of speeches and music, including a 1963 album that you see here, the All-Star Festival, meant to raise global awareness of refugees and raise money for the work of the UN's Human Rights, uh, of, of the UN's High Commission for Refugees. Today, there are refugees everywhere, the liner notes proclaimed, half a century before similar claims appear all over NGO and arts nonprofit websites. Hardly a day passes without men, women, and children tearing themselves away from their homes to become refugees. Putting together an album of songs, the UN insisted, was one way of fulfilling our collective, quote, responsibility toward the disinherited, they said. And the album featured a mildly international cast of mostly Western singers from the global north, like Louis Armstrong, Nana Mashkori, or Maurice Chevalier, Doris Day, Edith Piaf, among others, who all performed a repertoire of songs that they insisted avoided sentiment sentimentalizing the refugee. And instead, it made surprisingly, I think, sly and astute links between the emotional and lyrical landscapes of popular hit songs and the emotional landscapes of the refugee experience. Nana Mashkori's song, Cimarroni, that some of you might know, for example, gave the world the image of a peasant farmer um, traveling with a saddlebag over his shoulder, about to, set, to spread his sails to, to set sail into the sun and into oblivion. Or Caterina Valente's version of La Golondrina, the 1862 Mexican chestnut that has accompanied migrants north to the US ever since with its story of a swallow seeking shelter, sad and adrift in La Región Perdida, the lost region of migrant life. Now, there's much to be debated this is a good example of the um, UN's album cover art and their record labels. Much to be debated about the aims and impacts of many of these kinds of programs that I'm not going to get into right here, happy to talk about later. Um, but those sessions that I witnessed last year in Germany um, stuck with me. Because technically those were music classes, right? They were music workshops. But they weren't rehearsals for pieces of music as much as they were rehearsals for something else, for new kinds of society. Beyond the songs rooted and uh, the, beyond the songs that were notated in bright colors on the poster boards before them, what were those kids actually rehearsing in that class? They were being told to play a pre-existing language, but together in that room, body to body, life history to life history, what new music were they making? Was the music itself a temporary home, a momentary one, or was it even a precarious one? Was it a new society? a uh, new European social order, or so social order of Iraqis and Syrians and Afghanis who stop being refugees and actually get to live beyond welcome with political rights as free Syrians, Iraqis, and Afghanis in a country where, to use 
and mistranslate the German phrase, where the boat is never full, where the foreigner problem, the Auslander Problematik, is at the margins and not the center of German culture and European culture? Or was the rehearsal in those classrooms a new language for a community of strangers? So instead of all speaking German, they could now all speak this new music that they learned together, a music that they were being guided into speaking and learning, but a music that they were each having a direct hand in shaping. This was music in the making. New assemblies in formation, a new kind of improvised collective action that didn't smooth out all the differences between them, but allowed them to coexist together in the space of musical performance. One of, on one of the days I visited, the little girl I mentioned, the violinist, was the smallest of the bunch. She played her violin with like literally zero care for the music she was supposed to be following. She was plucking and pawing and stabbing and popping. She was out of time and out of tune, out of tempo, but she was so into it because she was following her own music. She was writing her own music. She was finding her way through the music, figuring out what her music was by playing it. Some nights, right before the sun goes down, a group of day laborers whose lives began in El Salvador and Mexico, Honduras and Guatemala, plug in guitars and keyboards and bass amps, and they play songs for a 10-story building surrounded by razor wire fencing. Their audience is literally a captive one, locked away inside the building, the Metropolitan Detention Center in downtown Los Angeles. Their audience are shadows outlined on slivers of security glass cell windows belonging to men who have overstayed their visas, men who have never had visas, men with children who earlier in the day they had dropped off at school, children who will finish school to learn that their father is now a shadow outlined on a sliver of security glass cell windows in downtown Los Angeles. Los Jonaleros del Norte, the band calls themselves, the day laborers of the North, call these performances that they do in LA, chant down the walls. It's an ambitious order that I think is better understood as a kind of theory. A theory, let's say, of the sound of escape or the sound of sonic, mig sonic migrancy, the sound of social motion. A theory that hypothesizes that the repetition of speech can alter an object. That the repetition of sound can de-verticalize a structure. That the repetition of song can topple and tumble and tear down. That chant can demonumentalize the monumental. That repetition of song is in itself a meditation on the possibility of bringing down walls, charting paths of escape, opening a door to the other side. On some nights, right before the sun goes down, the walls of the detention center, one of over a hundred just like it across the United States, these walls, of course, do not come down. But they are, I believe, chanted through. The band chants through the walls. The sounds they make penetrate the walls of the, of the cells of the detention center. They chant cumbias and they chant rancheras, which seep into the cement and steel, reverberations of rhythm and frequencies of melody that make it into the cells to reach their captive audience. The men inside the building, when they hear the music, turn the lights on in their cells, on and off, on and off, on and off, in time with the chants below. The band is saying to them, you are not alone and we sing for you. The captive audience cannot be heard singing back. They cannot be heard singing along, but they let the band know that they are listening, that they hear without speech or without sound in return. And they flash lights. They send an SOS. Their listening speaks. Last spring, 
Pate Sabali, a refugee from Gambia who had been living in Italy, jumped into the Venice Canal to kill himself. He was only 22 years old. A boat full of tourists filmed him flailing in the water, and with their, they filmed him with their cell phones, some calling him stupid, and others saying that he wants to die and shouting, go on, go back home. A few months later, as part of the Venice Biennale, the Sierra Leone-born, Berlin-based musician, Lamin Fofana, made a sound piece about Sabali's death that he called Witness, a reference to the witnesses on that boat who insulted him as he died, and a request, I suppose, that listeners and viewers of Lamine's piece bear the witness that others did not. Lamine was kind enough to send me a copy of the sound piece as an MP3 file through a link in an email. And after I downloaded it, I received a very quick follow-up email from him panicking that he had sent me the file with the wrong name, that there was a typo in the file. And I looked on my library, and sure enough, there it was. There was an H where there shouldn't have been one. The track had read not witness, but withness. But that accident produced a powerful new reading for me. Art as a kind of political witness is also about forging a politics of withnessing, of being with someone who is not ourselves, someone whose absence has been made present. On some nights, right before the sun goes down, a group of musicians in downtown Los Angeles make a music of witnessing, a music that says, I am with you, you are with me, I am hearing you in my song. Not done yet. <laughs> oh, lone traveler passing me, why are you leaving me and preoccupying me? You said goodbye with barely a salam. I'm giving you my heart. These eyes of my tears speak. Oh, lone traveler passing me. In the fire of desire, I will wait and be patient with my heart and hope. And though you don't come to me, I am happy. You make me desirous in your presence and promise me I'm afraid that the estrangement might be sweet for you and that the distance changes our condition. May I always be on your mind, O oh, lone traveler passing me. No matter how long the distance between us, my heart will never change. I will remember you more. But first, you must keep thinking of me. This song, famous song, by the Egyptian Golden Age singer Mohammed Abdel Wahab, was originally popularized as a simple love song, a, fl a fleeting love at first sight encounter with a stranger on the road that is now threatened by distance and estrangement. But when Abdallah Rahal, who you see here on the screen, sang this song last year in Berlin at a concert for recently arrived refugees, its message had other meanings for all of the Iraqis and Afghanis and all his fellow Syrians all of them in different ways, lone travelers, grappling with solitude and loss as they navigate Germany through refugee accommodation centers. When he was a lone travel crossing the Aegean Sea on the Balkan Peninsula months earlier, music was a tool of survival. Abdallah was a Tarab singer in Aleppo before the war became too much to bear, and he soon became yet another figure on that now familiar trail. You go from Syria to Lebanon to Turkey, get on a flooded boat to Greece that washed all of his documents away. And then he was on trains and buses and days and days of walking from Greece to Serbia to Austria to Germany. I tried to sing all the way, he told me. He traveled with people who had lost their children, their families, and their friends, and he knew 
that if he gave in to the sadness, he would lose himself as well. So he sang over the sea and over the land and at border checkpoints. And at the border in Korvatin, in front of rows of border police, he led 400 fellow travelers in an impromptu version of Syed Darwish's folk classic, El Helwadi, a song about the beauty of greeting a new morning as a rooster comes, as a rooster crows. <laughs> After the concert that he performed this song at, he decided it would be one of the last concerts he would sing as a refugee artist in Berlin. Because Abdallah learned that the songs that he had known his whole life and the songs that he was singing to stay alive could quickly become traps because he now was not Abdallah Rahal, the Tarab singer. He was that refugee singer who was getting gigs only because of his status as a refugee. He made a good story, a great story, and the media was ready for him. He had become equated with a juridical status he had not chosen, linked forever to his blue passport and to the job center. And he had become part of an economy, an industry of refugee spectacle that in the name of humanitarianism, humanitarianism he found could also dehumanize you. It was Franz Fanon remixed by 21st century Germany. Look, Ma, a refugee. Or a new version of what Max Frisch, the Swiss writer, playwright, had said decades earlier about the Gastarbeiter, guest worker programs in Europe of the 1960s. Frisch said, we wanted guest workers. We got human beings. Abdallah vowed to never again play a concert if he was invited as a refugee. He had to be invited as a Syrian, or as a musician, or as a human being. In the first place, Hannah Arendt wrote back in 1943 as a German Jewish exile, we don't like to be called refugees. I'm gonna end the presentation with a song much closer to home for me. It's a song written in 1862 tells the story of a young girl who is one of the few to survive the wreck of the SS Golden Gate, a steamship loaded full of gold from the California gold rush and headed for Mexico. It's a song that tells the story of a passenger who rescues a young girl named Addie from drowning in the ocean. In a recent performance of this song that I helped organize in San Francisco, I asked the singer-songwriter Tao Win if she would join the band. And when she did, she improvised her way into a new version of this song. And her voice rose to the top of the mix and for me changed it forever. When she started singing, I heard Tao's mother, a refugee from Vietnam, who decades earlier had survived different boats and different waters but I also heard so much more. I heard the Aegean Sea and the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Mediterranean. I heard the over 30,000 people who have died at sea since 2000 trying to cross into Europe. I heard the shipwrecks of the Keter Airades, the shipwreck of the Yohan. I heard the 21 Libyans who drowned on March 6th last year. I heard dinghies and I heard the Skyluck freighter, and I also heard the Zong slave ship whose captain threw 133 slaves aboard to murder them all and claim the insurance for cargo lost in the Arctic swells of global finance. I heard the 120,000 Africans who left Libya for Italy, the Dispersi and the Haraga, those who burned their papers. 
I heard the rickety carreta del mare, the small rickety boats, and the plastic inflatable dinghies and the commercial fishing boats. I heard the weaponized oceans and the militarized frontex seas of fortress Europe that have been barred from rescuing people, barred from rescuing people, just in the way that volunteers in the Arizona desert are now being found guilty for leaving water bottles for migrants in the, in the northern Mexican desert and southern U.S. desert. I heard the weaponized oceans, the weaponized deserts. I also heard the waves crashing against the Tijuana-San Diego border wall. I heard all the bodies that one band from Hamburg it was a song where they insist that bodies will be back, they sing. Bodies will be back. Bodies will be back. All the drowned, but also the survivors, all those fighting to find a place to stay free on their own terms, drowning neither into the sea or into the demands of a new country. A new country that, at least in Germany, as of about a month ago, is now even willing to pay migrants and refugees cash if they would just go home. That song, I Do Not Want to Be Drowned, actually has never been recorded, um, so I can't play it for you. Um, and Tao is not here to sing it for you, um, but I'll sing you a little bit. I need to warn you, I'm not a singer. <laughs> this is how Tao sang it. On deck, there is terror an agony wild. The ship is on fire as the ominous sound and pleading for life. You hear a motherless child. Oh, save me, do please. I don't want to be drowned. Oh, save me, do please. I don't want to be drowned. Oh, save me, do please. I don't want to be drowned. Thanks for listening. <clears throat> so we have seven minutes. Those are just like little, those are bits, vignettes from the work that I'm doing and the writing that I'm doing, and I'm happy to have a seven minutes worth of chat. Hi. Oh, thank you. How the question is, how did I come to have um, Pat? To you, to, I'll quote you to you to have passion for refugees. Um, well, I think there's a couple ways of answering that. I mean, I think one one would. Um, I'd like to think that we all would have passion um, on purely humanitarian reasons um, for displacement. People have been displaced forcibly for all those reasons, not just political, not just economic, um, but particularly, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, for issues around sexual violence, particularly. Roughly 50% of the world's forced migrants are women who can't go home because they'll be killed. There's a great New Yorker story that was done last year um, about Mexican women um, who have been deported to their death. Uh, because they're deported from the United States back to abusive uh, partners who kill them. Um, so there's that. Um, personally, I come from a family um, of Holocaust survivors um, and Holocaust fleers. Um, I was raised with a very, uh, very influential figure in my life, was a great uncle of mine who was a Greek Jew from Salonika, whose whole family was murdered in Auschwitz. Um, but he survived because he built furniture for the Nazis. And he got remarried in a DP camp in Germany uh, to my great aunt. And I grew up uh, in their world uh, in West Los Angeles, where displacement was just kind of like part of the, your life. And I grew up loving music, and they all love music. And um, that connection between music as a way of thinking about displacement and thinking and making sense of all that distance and all that exile um, was something that I've just carried with me. And then I would, uh, again, grew up in Los Angeles, which is an immigrant city city that doesn't exist without migration. Um, and not just from Mexico, uh, though we are a 50% Latino city, but is a hub. I think, you know, we're the um, largest, I think we're the 
largest Korean city outside of Korea, um, um, largest Chinese city outside of China, I think second largest Japanese city outside of Japan, largest Salvadoran city outside of El Salvador, largest Filipino city outside of the Philippines, et cetera, et cetera, largest Iranian city outside of Iran. Um, and you know, you can choose to be blind to that, many do. Um, but I think what makes a city like Los Angeles, what makes a region like Southern California so amazing in so many different levels, not just culturally, but economically, politically, is all of these flows. Um, and so I, I think I've been raised watching those things and um, thinking about them through music, which lends a different kind of relationship around empathy and ethics, I think, maybe. Um, I don't know if that answers it, but it's an attempt. Yeah. Hi. We can do and um, we can do the, the mic check where someone repeats what she said and go forward. What was the first, very first part? Was there music associated with the with with the uh, the Jewish flight from Nazi Germany, made by um, made in Europe? You mean? Certainly, yes. There was music that was um, performed. There's been lots of books and a couple of documentaries made about um, music performed um, and kept alive uh, in ghettos um, in Germany uh, with some, some singing in camps. Uh, there's been some ethnomusicological research on that. Um, but really, the big story of that, of course, is the whole history of 20th century music in the United States. Um, there's really, it's, it's hard to imagine what Hollywood music, what art music, what um, contemporary symphonic music in the United States would be without all of those exiles. Um, of course, there's parts of Los Angeles that you can drive four blocks and you know, that's where Schoenberg lived and that's where the Gershwins lived and that's where Adorno lived and this community of immigrant and exile musicians who all had different relationships, not just to Nazi Europe, but to uh, earlier decades of flight um, uh, from Eastern Europe uh, you know, there's been a couple books about this, um, that there would be no music and maybe even no contemporary art as we know it um, without all of those migrants and refugees coming to the U.S. And let's remember those refugees who were initially denied entry into the United States, um, that um, Jews fleeing Nazi Germany were turned away uh, on boats before they were let in. So we've lived these moments before. Um, and culturally and artistically, I think, there's no, ar there's no way to argue around the fact that, that the United States, as we know it, as an artistic nation, is impossible um, without all of these populations, not just Jews and not just Europeans, but without the force of migration, the, the original sin of forced migration of transatlantic slavery. There'd be no music in the United States um, without the enslaved becoming free. So it's a big, I think, an important part of these conversations. I'm going to definitely not pitch it as a CD thing in there because then my, I think my publisher is going to say, yeah, that sounds good. Um, I don't know. It's a great question. I, I was in a session yesterday where I shared my, uh, my anxiety about this project and writing it is the struggle to capture um, the sound of this music on the page. Like it's a real challenge, I think, as a writer. So I'm really working hard. Um, luckily, we are in a moment where with streaming platforms like Spotify, for example, or SoundCloud, I should be able to make this music available to people for free, though there are a lot of recordings that I've made or that others have given me that aren't available. So yes, there would be a way. What I really want to do with this, to be honest, and we'll, um, if I say it enough, someone's going to say, here's a check, um, is, is I, w I, I, want to, I want to launch this as a, as a stage show, and I want to um, perform it as a series of texts that are delivered by writers and actors and activists, and, um, but with a full band on stage um, of migrant and refugee musicians playing songs from the past century um, about immigration and, and distance and loss, but also of, of hope. Great question. How did I do the research for this so through primary, uh, primary sources, interviews? Um, it's a mix. So this is a mix of cultural kind of old, old fashioned cultural history of doing that research, particularly on the 20th century part up to now. Um, 
you know, really being on top of what's happening in terms of contemporary debates and incidents within refugee and migrant life, but then going to musicians. And really, I wish I could tell you, this is my mean, like bad professor mode, that I had a really good um, uh, scientific approach to this, but it was as simple where I started doing this in LA, where I just started noticing. So the band who played outside the detention center, I just started hanging out and asking them questions and um, started writing about them and asked if I could. And then when I went to Berlin last year, I just started asking around. Someone gave me the name of one musician. Uh, then that person gave me another name and another name, and P it just became for seven months, every day, it was someone said, oh, you haven't talked to that trumpet player? You have to talk to that trumpet player. And then I'd go, you haven't talked to that drummer? Go talk to that drummer. You haven't been to that refugee center? You need to go to that refugee center. And it was this really generous chain of people saying, here's who you need to talk to. So um, the book is a mix of all those, kind of in a way, some of the stuff you heard, like a mix of that kind of writing and, and that kind of reporting. Hi, oh, do we have time? We're done. I got this. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.